Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today's part 13 of the AI series where we're doing procedural map mesh baking. We're going to do this by limiting the player to walk only on the X axis within 10 units on the Z. And as we spawn new chunks of level as the player walks farther down or farther back on the X axis, we will remove pieces that they can't see and then bake the nav mesh again onto the newly spawned piece of floor. You can see that up here, you should have been able to already see it. And what that's going to do is allow us to limit how big our nav mesh is that we're trying to bake, because doing baking at runtime is kind of a touchy subject, especially if you're targeting like a mobile platform. You want to really keep that nav mesh as small as possible whenever you bake, otherwise the players will notice there's a stutter whenever it happens depending on their device specifications. When you start talking about consoles or desktops, you can have a little bit larger ones before it's really noticeable. And you can also tweak the nav mesh surface settings like we talked about in AI series part 10 with the flying nav mesh agent. There's a bunch of settings there that'll help you make it go faster or slower whenever you do the baking. This is a really cool one. Let's hop in and check it out. Since we're talking about procedural nav mesh generation, in this video we also need a procedural level. So I made a new scene where it has the same basic structure, I just don't have very much in it. We have the directional light, world geometry, a floor manager object that currently does nothing, the same player we've been using, and the main camera that is the exact same as we had before. If you're following along, you can actually copy paste the player and the main camera into a new scene, create an empty world geometry object, and attach a nav mesh surface to that world geometry object. In there, we're only going to use a player on this particular video. Just make sure that it has the collect objects children and you can leave everything else alone. I've also constructed a floor section in Pro Builder. It's a 10 by 10 Pro Builder cube for the floor where I have a one by one by 10 cube on either side. Those stretch the entire length of the cube in the X axis direction. So the red line on the transform tool is the X axis and the blue one is the Z axis. So on both ends of the cube on the Z axis, we're going to put a cube that extends the entire way that's just to prevent the player from like thinking that they can fall off it's not really mandatory it just kind of makes a level it feel more like an actual level or an actual game inside of there i put some obstacle cubes they're two by one by one and three by one by one again the, there's nothing special about how these are set up the walls all have a nav mesh modifier to make them not walkable so we don't get any nav mesh on top of them the most important part of this is the end and the beginning Pro Builder cubes here. They stretch the entire length on the Z axis of the cube, and these are triggers. So on Pro Builder, you can use the set trigger functionality here at the bottom right. That just makes them invisible and turns them to be a mesh glider that is a trigger. We're gonna use those later to tell when the player is exiting or entering a new floor section and to despawn and spawn new sections of floor. It's really important you don't put these at the very edge of the floor section because if they're all the way there, then the player can potentially get into a situation where they've entered the beginning of the next floor section without fully exiting the end of the current section and that kind of messes up the logic here. They're about one meter away from the edge. So depending on the size of your player in your actual Game, you may need to just tweak the positioning of these a little bit to make sure that they trigger in the correct order because it's important that they if they're going forward they trigger end and then beginning and if they're going backwards they trigger beginning on their current cube and then end on the previous one we're going to make three new scripts, one called the floor manager one called the floor section and one called the floor end trigger If we hop to the floor section, we'll make the floor section extend the poolable object class. This will be the that prefab we were just looking at. We'll do a public int index. That'll be the index and world space that this particular floor section is. We'll add a public delegate void reach end event floor section section. We'll just pass in the floor section that is reaching the end. And we'll make two public reach end events, one called on reach end and one called on reach beginning. These will be triggered like I was just talking about whenever the player enters the end section or the beginning section on that particular floor section. The last thing that we need to do in this class is override the on disable because we want to reset the on reach beginning and on reach end to null 
and then called it base.onDisable. We want to do this so that way we don't have a bunch of delegate functions that just keep stacking up on these reach end events as we recycle this object in the pool. Next up, we're going to open the floor and trigger class. In here, I'll make a public bool is end set that to false by default. Instead of having a floor end trigger and a floor beginning trigger class, I just thought it'd be easier to have them be the same class since they do the exact same thing and just distinguish between them with the is end variable that we'll set up in the inspector. We'll then do a serialized field private floor section parent. That's the floor section that these triggers belong to. And since these are triggers, what we're going to do is private void on trigger enter. That's triggered whenever a rigid body collider enters this trigger. We'll do if other dot get component player is not equal to null. So if a player is entered and that should be the only thing, we will check if it is the end trigger. If it is, we will do parent question mark dot on reach end question mark dot invoke parent. That's the same as doing parent dot on reach end passing in the parent, but we're doing a little bit more safe. We're checking if parent's null and if on reach end is null, just so that way if for some reason something's not hooked up properly, it just won't work. It won't like explode. It's the same as if you checked if parent is not null and then checked if on reach end is not null and then called them. And in the other case, we'll just do the exact same thing, but on reach beginning. So parent question mark dot on reach beginning question mark dot invoke parent. If we hop back to the Unity editor, let's set up this prefab. We'll select the root floor section game object and attach to the floor section script. Then on the end, we'll attach a floor end trigger, make sure is end is checked and drag the floor section to the parent. And we'll do the exact same thing on the beginning. We'll add the floor end trigger script, make sure is end is false and drag the floor section to the parent reference. Then we'll hop back to the scripts and set up the floor manager. In the floor manager, we're going to add a bunch of variables here. There's kind of a lot to keep track of. So we'll do a private transform world geometry, serialize that field, private transform player, serialize that field, private array of floor sections, floor prefabs, serialize that field, have a private int target floor sections, set that to three by default, also serialize that field and give it the range from three to 10 attributes. So that way in the inspector, you will get a slider that will limit your inputs from three to 100. I think I said 10 a second ago, it's 100. We need at least three sections because the spawning algorithm we're gonna use for these floors is the player will be on one section. There should be one behind them and one in front of them, at least. We're assuming these floors are not large enough that you can travel to the end of one and not see into the abyss of of the skybox or whatever. So we want at least one to be in front of us at all times so that the player thinks that the world is a contiguous world and there's no just ending. We'll also add a private int half target floor sections that's gonna be used to help manage the floor section spawning later. We will not serialize that field because it doesn't matter in the inspector at all and it's a calculated value. We'll put a private int active section like we were talking about on the floor section, those have an index. This active section will correspond to one of those floor section indices and this is world space index coordinates that'll help us spawn the floor sections reasonably. I'll do a private constant floor size equals 10 because I made the floor sections 10 by 10. There are other ways to calculate this value that are more dynamic and not error prone. Since we have an array of floor sections, we also need a private object pool array called pools. I want this to work with potentially multiple nav mesh surfaces. So I'm doing a private nav mesh surface array of surfaces. In this video, we're only using one surface so that doesn't have to be an array. But if you want to take this code and use it where you maybe have multiple players or something like that, that have different nav mesh agent types, you'll need this to be an array. And the last one is a private dictionary of int to floor section called active floor sections. And that's going to map the world space index to a particular floor section. We'll implement the awake function, check if world geometry is null, or if the world geometry does not have a nav mesh surface. And if that's the case, we're going to log an error saying the world geometry is improperly configured, set this game object to false and return. We don't want to do anything else because it's improperly set up. If it is properly set up, then we'll do surfaces equals world geometry dot get components and children nav mesh surface. That will find all nav mesh surfaces that are children of world geometry and store them into that surfaces array. That way, if you have attached four nav mesh surfaces to the world geometry, we get all of them. We'll also instantiate a new array of object pools being the floor prefabs length. And then we'll iterate over all the floor prefabs and create object pool instances for each of the floor prefabs. And we'll set the default size to be target floor sections plus two because that's our target, but we may need up to two additional floors to make sure that we have all of the padding around the user that we need based on the size of the target floor sections. We'll then implement the start function, half target floor sections equals target floor sections divided by two. 
Notice that these are all integers, so we do some integer division here, meaning if we have target floor sections be three, we'll actually get one for half target floor sections, which is actually what we want. I'm not doing any float casting here because we're dealing strictly with integers. And then we're gonna do kind of a weird for loop. We're gonna do for int i equals negative one times half target floor sections. So in the case again of three, that'll be negative one times positive one, because so it's negative one. And we'll do i less than half target floor sections plus one, which again would be one plus one, which would be two. So we're going from negative one to two in this case. And we wanna do that because we're saying that the player starts at zero index. So we wanna spawn one behind him, one at zero, and then one in front of him. So that'd be negative one, zero, and one, which is exactly what this for loop gives us. Inside this for loop, we'll do spawn floor section, and we'll pass in a Boolean of i is equal to half target floor sections, and we'll pass the second parameter to be i. That'll make more sense once we come down here and say private void spawn floor sections, bool bake nav mesh, and int floor index. So if we look above, we're saying we wanna bake the nav mesh when we have i equal to half target floor sections. That'd be the last iteration of that loop. That way we're not baking the nav mesh each time that we spawn a floor section. We only wanna do it after we've spawned all of them. And we pass in the floor index as the index of that for loop there. The first thing we'll do in here is check if the active floor sections, that's the dictionary of int to floor sections, contains the key floor index. So if we already have spawned something here, we don't wanna do anything. We don't want duplicate prefabs on the same place. That's kind of silly. So if we need to actually spawn something, we will generate a random number between zero and the length of the object pools. So we'll pick which particular floor section we'd like to spawn. We'll then spawn that object using the pools index by index dot get object as a floor section because we know all of these are floor sections. And we check if the spawned object is not null. If it's not, we will add this floor index and that spawned object to the dictionary of active floor sections. And then we'll actually position this object where it needs to be. So we'll do spawned object dot transform position equals a new vector three, the floor size times the floor index. So let's take this again, looking at a start loop at negative one, we would be negative one times 10. So it'd be spawned at the negative 10 and expand up to zero on the X axis and zero, zero on Y and Z. If we take zero, that would spawn then at zero and go to positive 10. And then once we hit one, it would spawn at 10 and go to 20. We'll also set up the spawn object on reach beginning and on reach end callback functions. We'll set that to be handle reach beginning and handle reach end. We'll implement those in a second. We'll set the spawned object index to be the floor index. And then the really key part of this is we want to put the spawned object as a child of the world geometry, saying that it should retain its world position because we already positioned it correctly. And we configured the world geometry to only collect objects from children. So we didn't want it to take the entire scene into consideration, only the children. And the last thing is if we passed in bake nav mesh is true, we want to iterate over all of our nav mesh surfaces and call this function build nav mesh that actually does the baking of the nav mesh for us. So this is like the key highlight of how you do it is build nav mesh. Now let's implement the handle reach end function. So that's private void handle reach end that takes a floor section section. We'll check if the floor section is equal to the active section. If it is, then we'll spawn a new floor section saying yes, bake the nav mesh at the active section plus half the target floor sections plus one. So again, let's take this example like we're spawned at the zero active index and we've reached the end. So we're walking on the positive X axis. We hit the on reach end trigger. We want to spawn a new floor section at what index two, right? Because we already have index one spawned. So that will give us, that's exactly what this is doing. We're saying active section, which is zero plus half target floor sections. That's one plus one is two. So we'll spawn that one ahead of where the player is. So once they reach the next section, the active section one, they will already be a new piece of floor section in front of them. So they won't see the end of the world. The other case would be if we're going backwards. So if we're going on the negative X axis, which is section index is less than the active section, then I'm writing trim floors. In that case, we're going backwards. We want to get rid of the one that's the farthest in front. So that's what trim floors would do. So the one with the highest X position or the highest index, we would remove, add it back to our object pool. So that way we can spawn it again, which is what we do on the next line, spawn it at where? floor sections minus half the target floor sections minus one. So let's take again the exact same example. We're at zero traveling on the negative X axis. When we hit the end trigger of negative one, we want to remove the one that's at one because we can't see that one anymore. Add it back to our object pool and spawn another one that would be at 
what, negative two, because we're entering negative one. That way, again, we can't see the end of the world. Active section would be zero minus half target floor sections is one, minus one is negative two. And then what we wanna do is say we've actually entered a new section. So we wanna set our active section to be this section index, which would then be negative one. Now, since I've been talking about how we re-add stuff to the pool, let's go ahead and implement that with private void trim floors. I'm gonna do for each int key in active floor sections dot keys. So we're gonna go through all of the keys in our dictionary, which again, at the beginning, of this would be negative one, zero, and one. We'll check if the key is greater than half the target floor sections plus the active section. So let's take this case where we called it above, handle reach end. Half target floor sections would be one, active section would be zero. So if key is greater than that, which it would not be because we'd be negative one, or if key is less than active section minus half target floor sections, that's key would be negative one, less than zero minus one is false again. So we would do nothing in that particular case. And that's why we needed our object pools to have plus two size because our target four sections is what ideally we'd like but we may need to go over that to make sure the player can still see the world in the event let's go one more down let's say we're on the negative one and we're going down again to negative two then we would hit this where the key of one would be greater than half target four sections one plus active section negative one zero the one that was at target index one would trigger this to be true we disable it with active four sections indexed by key which would be one dot game object that set active false we would then remove that from our dictionary so that way we didn't know it was there anymore and then we'd terminate this loop so we're only removing one because we know based on this algorithm and the way that our triggers are set up we will only be doing one at a time and how do we know that let's implement the private void handle reach beginning floor section section if the section dot index is greater than the active section we're going to set the active section to be our current section the one that we just reached the beginning of and then we're going to call trim floors let's take this on the walking forward on the x-axis example if we're at zero we hit the end of our zero, which would be section index equals active section. So we'd spawn one at two, then nothing else would happen. So we'd keep walking. We'd eventually hit the beginning of index one. Index one is greater than our, our active section, which would be zero at that time. Active section turns to one, then we trim floors. So we come down here, we say that our active section is one. Key of negative one would be less than active section minus one, which would be zero, right? One minus one is zero. Set that one to be inactive, remove it from our floor sections list, and then return. Now that we have the algorithm in place, Let's go hook it up in the scene view. So we'll select the floor manager game object, attach the floor manager script, hook up the world geometry and the player. I'll drag the floor prefab to the floor prefab list. I'm gonna leave the floor sections as three and active section as zero. I'll also drag the scene view over here so we can see the level get spawned because from our player perspective, it's a totally contiguous world. There's never any changes. It just always looks like it goes on forever. If I then click play, let's walk through a couple of these scenarios. Immediately at the beginning, we see the three floor sections are spawned, negative one, zero, and one. As I walk forward, I trigger the on reach end trigger because I'm walking on the positive X axis. We see a new floor section comes into view. So I have four floor sections spawned. Once I move forward a little bit more to the beginning, we'll see what I was just talking about where the previous section is removed, but I'm not rebaking the nav mesh here because it actually doesn't matter. I can't click all the way over there and I don't know that that floor isn't there anymore. So instead of spending the extra CPU cycles to bake there, we'll just wait until we have a new floor section added to bake it again. If I start going backwards, we see the on beginning, nothing happens on my current one. Once I walk down to hit the on end of the previous one, we see a new floor section spawns below me, but the top one is still there. Once I hit the beginning of the next one, we'll see that one goes away. So regardless of how far on the x-axis I travel, the world just keeps spawning and the player never notices that the world ends. And if you have more floor variety than I've done here, your player could have an entirely unknown world going forward. As I run backwards, exact same thing happens. The only thing to potentially consider here is you might want to store the indices that you use for each world index. So that way, as a player runs forward and backwards, they get the same experience instead of totally random ones. Because if I run forward and I get floor prefab one and then run backwards and then come back to that same spot and I get floor prefab 15, it's kind of disorienting. So if your player has the freedom to go backwards and forwards, you may consider storing for what world space index corresponds to which floor section. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how the procedural level generation works, how to make new dynamic pieces of floor content so that way you can make a more dynamic level than one with only one prefab, and how to bake the nav mesh based on those 
active floor sections. If you've been getting value out of this video or the series, please like and subscribe to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. There's new videos posted every Tuesday, sometimes on other days too. And if you have any questions, a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below, and I'll see you on the next video.